So hi, good morning, good afternoon, good night, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Karen A. And this is the RICO 12 podcast. I'm live in Jerusalem. That means it's mid-morning here for me. And it is my honor and delight to bring to you this RICO 12 podcast. RICO 12 is a family of recovery resources that help anyone suffering from addiction or are related to those suffering from addiction any fellowship, any affliction. So whether you're an alcoholic, workaholic, sexaholic, porn addict, workaholic, um, what else? Compulsive overeater, anorexic, bulimic, shopaholic, and, and you name it. Hopefully there's someone on here that relates to you, that you relate to them, and that has a message for you. On Rico12.com, you'll find a great library of podcasts, including Noodle Out with Nikki, the Big Book Round Book, Roundup uh, Table with Justin B, and a number of other shares, people sharing their experience, strength, and hope across fellowships across the world. Today, I'm delighted to bring to you my fellow, um, and, and we share a bunch of, of fellows and people on our own recovery squads, even though we're across the Atlantic from one another. Here is Andy H. waking up real early in New Jersey, going to any lengths to share his recovery story. And you'll have about 20, 25 minutes. I'm not so strict. I can kind of let you know, or you can let me know when you're just about done uh, to share your experience, strength, and hope a little bit about yourself, your journey, um, and what you do today to be helpful to others, serve God and your fellows. Um, if anyone would like to contribute a seventh tradition, you could do that at rico12.com forward slash support. Without further ado, my fellow Andy H. Thank you. Oh, we just got a bunch of people hopping on. Maybe, maybe wait one second, take a deep breath. <laughs> we could all say the serenity prayer together. Does that work? And uh, we'll jump in. Could say the we version. God, God. grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change. The courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. Your will not mine be done. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you, Karen. Hey, everybody. My name is Andy. I'm blessed to be an alcoholic, blessed to be with everybody at this gathering. Um, I always like to begin with a prayer. Thomas Merton, a uh, a uh, really vital spiritual teacher for me, and I'm sure many others um, said when asked about God that silence makes more sense than words, but he also gave us this prayer. God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire and all that I'm doing. I hope I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I will not fear because you are ever with me, and I will never, ever have to face my perils alone. Amen. Look at God. Um, it's an honor and privilege, um, but ultimately responsibility to give back to Alcoholics Anonymous. A, save my life. No two ways about it. Um, you know, honestly, I can never give back to A what's been given to me, but I could try one day at a time. And I want to thank, you know, Karen, Justin, everyone behind the scenes here. Um, this is an awesome effort you guys do. And you can't imagine how many people you help, inclu including me, um, by having this um, this platform. Um you know, my story has been generous. Um, as some people say, I'm here for the full catastrophe. I, I didn't get to you, you know, because of a few bad weekends. I got to you because of a few bad decades. Um, you know, I, uh, I have um, a story that, um, you know, may for some newcomers uh, or others, um, you know, come from a place where folks can't identify. Um because, see, I was like that, too, you know, because, see, the details of our stories sometimes separate us, but the truth and the miracles bring us together. Um, and, uh, 
this is a program of miracles, the 12 steps. Um, the journey that um, I've been blessed to go on has been um, filled with, um, with tough moments, with joyous moments, um, but with real moments. And finally, I get, you know, after living, you know, a life like an ingrown hare and, uh, you know, living on that so-called island of misfit toys, I finally get to a place where I can um, be at peace. Um, you know, where happiness is a byproduct, um, not something I'm striving for, but happiness is a byproduct of, of doing the next right thing, you know, and finding a place and a purpose in this world, um, you know, despite, you know, many years of, of flailing around, um, and not fitting in anywhere. Um, my sobriety dates, October 21st, 2005. That's when, um, the, how should I put it? The, uh, the, the whisper of desperation grew to a scream and it was louder than the obsession to drink. Uh, I remember that date. It's actually, you know, a little over 19 years ago. I was fortunate to celebrate 19 years, um, you know, about a week and a half ago. I remember that. Um, and it's not because um, it keeps me sober because see our book, our big book, you know, I'll talk a lot about the big book. Um, you know, I'm what you might say an Orthodox fundamental, um, you know, member of Alcoholics Anonymous and CA, I should say, um, which means that I cry a lot and I talk about the big book and I don't apologize for, for that at all. Um, but uh, that drink that I had were, uh, at, at the last one were two warm shots of Jägermeister. Um, it's a Friday night. I know that because I can look on my calendar going back as my wife, Susan, you know, was going on out with her friends. And, but she was in total disgust at that point because see, prior to that point, I had gotten, um, into a rehab, got thrown out of that rehab. And, um, you know, I thought I was asked to leave, but you know, I was really thrown out. So, um, why that is my date, um, why I, you know, was separated by God at that moment. Um, I can't tell you, but I had nothing to do with it. And that's the beauty of it. I don't have to explain it. I just know that that's the date. The thing is though, that that memory that doesn't keep me sober. Um, I'm told and very clearly, and it's been my experience that, you know, I will have strange mental blank spots at certain times. And I'm not going to know what those times are. So if I'm sitting there saying that, you know, um, you know, remember that date and stick to that date, um, and it's going to keep me sober, that's not been my experience. Um, in the end, though, for me, it's truly by God's grace, by the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, by the 12 steps, which changed me, um, by good sponsorship, by the men and women that I've been blessed to sponsor, and my family, my wife and kids that have been with me right from the beginning, that I get to live a life well beyond anything that I ever could have imagined. Um, if you would ask me to write down, you know, what I wanted when I came in, in the summer of 2005, <laughs> almost anything that I would list uh, then is not what I would list today. Um, I would have sold myself short. Um, so I'll give you, you know, a quick, you know, story here of, you know, my journey. You know, I had 30 years out there. Um, in which I wanted to get back to that one moment in summer camp at age 15 when alcohol completed me. I had an ice cold beer in summer camp, you know. Um, I'm somebody who was born in Brooklyn, New York, and a lot of times we got sent up to the Catskill Mountains, you know, um, some, you know, beautiful mountains up in upstate New York. And uh, I'd been a camper for years, and then suddenly now I'm like a counselor and a waiter, and you know, I get offered this ice cold beer and I drink it and um, I'm electrified. Um, at that moment, um, you know, I came from the outside of the circle to the inside of the circle. Um, Bill Wilson, you know, co-founder talks about being, you know, arrived, you know, I'd finally arrived and uh, I could talk to girls now. I could talk to guys. I could dance better, play the guitar better, all that stuff. Um, and I chased that. I chased that for so long. Um, you know, I, I wanted to get back to that moment when, um, life was acceptable. And, uh, because see, I had discovered this thing that finally, 
finally um, allowed me to to feel okay for a moment in my skin. You know, the great effect of alcohol for me was that it was able to rivet me into the moment and make life acceptable. Um, see, I needed a drink way before I ever picked up a drink. And what alcohol did for me was treat my alcoholism until it didn't work anymore. It was an artificial way to a spiritual experience. And little did I know that down the road I was going to I was going to crawl into Alcoholics Anonymous and discover the true bona fide way to a spiritual awakening. And that's the 12 steps, the formula for sobriety, the formula for God, and the formula for the good life. The instruction manual for the unfoldment of our souls, as others have put it. By the way, if you hear something that sounds familiar, that's good. Because um, in Alcoholics Anonymous, in Cocaine Anonymous, in all the fellowships, right, um, plagiarism is wisdom only stupidity is original so if you hear something that sounds familiar that's good that means that hopefully god is speaking through me that god has appropriated my voice and you're not hearing me you're hearing the spiritual wisdom that gets shared in all these rooms um so after you know that uh, that first drink um I chased it because, see, I was treated. You know, we talk about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, the spiritual malady, the other side of the dash in step one, the unmanageability. And I had that unmanageability. We talk about it as restless, irritable, and discontented in a doctor's opinion. I'm restless. I can't sit still. I'm irritable. I'm easily annoyed. I'm discontented. Wherever I am is not the place to be. And it gets expanded upon on page 52 in the bedevilments. You know, being tortured by loneliness, by fear, by not getting along with people. And I've had that right from Jump Street, right from the beginning. And it's nobody's fault. I just came into the world separate, apart, and different. And uh, it's nobody's fault, you know. So when I had that first drink, I felt that all of that stuff just suddenly receded into the background. And I chased that for 30 years. I'm a New York City club animal, retired, which means that, you know, I went through a lot of different music genres. And I love to talk about music today because, see, I was so wasted back in the day that, you know, I didn't hear the lyrics. You know, I didn't hear anything um, back then. But now my life, as opposed to the when I got to you, which was a cappella, today it's an absolute symphony. And I can speak to the lyrics today, many of them. Many of them talk about talk about the internal spiritual malady, the search for wholeness that our you know co-founder Bill Wilson, in letters between Carl Jung, the noted psychiatrist, who gave us the second part of step one because Carl Jung understood that we had a spiritual thirst for wholeness or a union for God. Um, I can talk about that today. Because, see, you know, there are folks that have written about it for years and years. Rod Stewart wrote this song, Every Picture Tells a Story, right? It goes back a long ways. And Rod Stewart said, I spend some time feeling inferior, standing in front of my mirror, comb my hair a thousand different ways, but I came out looking just the same. Um, that was me on the inside, right? Always trying to make the outsides, you know, better. But this has always been an inside job. Um, yeah. So time went on 30 years, a lot of different music genres, um, you know, from from punk to new wave to to funk to heavy metal to everything. And I'm part of it all. You know, I'm going out to the New York City clubs and whatever club I was at always seemed not to be the place to be. I was always searching for the yet the, the, the next club and the next club. You know, and as time goes on, after 30 years or so, you know, I'm married, have two kids. And it's kind of strange when you're, you know, age 42 or age 43 and you're you're standing at the edge of a dance floor, you know, drunk, looking around and asking yourself, is this all there is? And I had been there at age 19. Um, yeah, I had no answer. So I went back to the bar. I went back to the bar. And the way I got to you to fast forward a bit, um, it wasn't out of virtue. You know, it wasn't out of... Um, consequences on the outside you know that hadn't happened just yet see i'm filled with a lot of not yet 
which helped, which hurt me when I got to you because you were telling stories of, of heartbreak, of loss. Um, some of you were incarcerated. Some of you had, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of DUIs, you own telephone poles, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but see, that wasn't my story. See, I got to you because I got caught. Um, one, one, uh, one day, you know, in summer 2005, I'm already drinking, you know, and my job was about 40 miles away from where I lived. So I was able, you know, to take that long commute, start drinking, maybe picking up another substance. And I get to work that particular day and I get a call from my wife, Susan, by the way, we're still married, you know, we're married 39 years. Alcoholics Anonymous saved my life and saved our marriage for sure. Um, because in the end, really, the steps are about relationships, moving from resentment to forgiveness. And there's been a lot of that, but there's still work in progress. And if we get to December this year, we'll be 40 years. But that's another story. We'll probably get there. In any event, um, she calls me and uh, tells me that a lot of money's missing. And there's that moment where, you know, there's a pause See, what I believe today is that God paralyzed the liar in me. You know, I ran out of lives. See, I had become a champion liar. I had had a double life, you know. No one knew what I was doing. No one knew that from ice cold beer and summer camp on the weekends, you know, I'm now 24-7 and I'm not sleeping. You know, I'm getting up in the middle of the night drinking. Um, somehow I'm able to still um, get through the day, take my daughter to school in the morning and then get to work and then start it all over again. See, every day was the same. But at that point, at that moment, God paralyzed the liar in me and there was a pause. And Susan said, what's wrong? Do you have cancer? And I said, no, I think I'm an alcoholic. Well, uh, the crap really hit the fan at that point because see, she didn't know I was in the throes of an absolute fatal illness that was this close, this close to killing me. Um, and from that moment on, everything changed, you know, made a phone call, went into this rehab. I promptly went into that rehab and, um, you know, I sat there, I couldn't talk. If I cried, it was ice cold tears. See, I got to you frozen like an icicle. I didn't get to you as a hot mess with consequences on the outside. But at this point, you know, I was completely frozen. The best way to describe me, you know, for so many years, was in a short story by Oscar Wilde called The Picture of Dorian Gray. It's been made into a movie many times. Back in the day, um, you know, that story was real popular. And what it told, you know, was my story. See, Dorian Gray was this very handsome um, man about town, you know, very social. Everybody envied him. Good looking guy, right? And he had a portrait made. The portrait was made and put it into a closet. And as years went on, Dorian Gray, you know, and everybody else started getting older. But Dorian Gray did not show his age. He looked the same as he was in his 20s. People are in their 40s. And people are curious, how do you do it? How do you look this way? And eventually he looked into the closet and he saw, he saw the portrait. And the portrait was hideous. It was disgusting. He couldn't look at it. The portrait was what he was like inside. And I don't know about you, but in those days, you know, as I'm drinking and using and trying to maintain that everything was just fine, I'm being ripped apart from this disease from the inside out. You know, I'm hemorrhaging inside. I can't do it anymore, but I don't have an answer. And then at the moment when Susan said that the money was missing, um, I believe today that God just simply said, you've had enough. Um, now, I wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't my sobriety date when, she, when Susan caught me, you know, but it wasn't, it was soon after that. That was the end. When I got to rehab, you know, I sat there, couldn't give you a clean urine and eventually um, was thrown out. But what happened was that you folks came in, folks from Alcoholics Anonymous came in and brought a typical meeting into that, into that facility. So that's where I know today that my recovery didn't start with step one. It didn't start with step zero. It started with the 12th step in your hearts. You were doing service. 
And after that, I ended up just crawling into the same home group I have today. It's called the Morning After Group of Westwood, New Jersey. We meet online. Bagels Love and Fellowship, 1030 a.m. Eastern every Saturday. We also have a bricks and mortar meeting um, in the same church that I crawled into. I came into that basement in 2005 and I was welcomed. I was engulfed in what I didn't want at that moment, which was everybody hugging, everybody laughing. Um, I just wanted to be left alone. But you folks didn't leave me alone. See, what happened for me was that... Um, you said to me a lot of things. You said, welcome home. You said everything you did brought you to where you are today, where you belong, home. And uh, I do to this day remember, though, what seems to be the most important thing, and that was we're going to love you until you can love yourself. Uh, and it's been talked about in music, the relief for a second that I got. There's an old song, you know, called The Morning After, right? Um, it was written in the 1970s. And one of the lines is, can't you see the morning after? It's waiting right outside the storm. Why don't we find a bridge together and cross this bridge and find a place that's safe and warm? Bob Dylan wrote a similar verse. Beautiful song. Shelter from the song. He said, I was burned from exhaustion, buried in the hail, poisoned in the Bushes and blown out on the trail, hunted like a crocodile, ravaged in the corn, come in, she said, I'll give you shelter from the storm. That's what you gave me, shelter from the storm. But that's not enough. See, in the end, after about six months, I was ready to, <laughs> I don't know, I was going out of my mind because, see, the steps hadn't infiltrated in me. I hadn't had a first step experience. I was caught in what some people call step zero, going round and round and round, um, thinking that I have more than two options. It's contained on page 30, you know. I hadn't conceded to my innermost self that I was one of you, even though I was taking people to meetings, right? I was going to meetings myself. I was chairing meetings. I was trying to read the big book. And eventually that step zero fuse had a, had a burn through me in which all of the denial, delusion, and refusal to believe I was one of you had to be crushed. We talk about in one page, you know, in our big book, page 152, we talk about the, um, the jumping off place where we can't live with alcohol and can't live without it. And we know a loneliness that few, few experience. I had another jumping off place. I couldn't live with AA and I couldn't live without it, right? I'm stuck in purgatory. I can't, I, I know I gotta be here but I'm feeling worse because see, not having that step one experience, not identifying with you um, was killing me. And what happened? I burned through that fuse with my sponsor on page 30 and saw that I was one of you. And it happened in a parking lot. The conclusion of that step zero happened in a parking lot in which I saw that the only two options are to die an alcoholic death and live on a, or live on a spiritual basis. That had to happen for me. And there was a guy called Jimmy Shoes, um, who my sponsor asked me to call, and I called Jimmy Shoes. They call him Jimmy Shoes because he put shoes on horses. We got a lot of colorful characters in New Jersey. We got Billy Bag of Donuts. We've got a whole bunch of stuff, Janet from Another Planet. But Jimmy Shoes, I called, and he listened to me blabber for about five minutes, and he said, kid, the party's over. And it was as if the most profound, most eloquent thing ever got said to me. And he said, you got that? And I hung up the phone and he said, and I said to myself, it's over. It's over. Um, I was exhausted, but now I was exhilarated because finally um, I felt that I was going to be okay. And I could now look at this big book with my sponsor and begin to identify. See, God is the author of all truth. And in that moment, I was convicted of the truth. Time collapsed and I saw that I was one of you. And what did I see? I saw that I was a real alcoholic. I saw that I was powerless in two ways, that I have a physical allergy to alcohol, which means when I take a drink, the drink takes me and I can't stop. 
But if that's not enough, the second part is that I have an obsession to drink. You know, I believe it to be a mental illness. It's an illness in the sense that <laughs> it's greater than any, any, um, any urge to not stop. It's greater, as some people say, than a mother's love for her children. It will take me back, despite the fact that I don't have alcohol in my body, I won't remember the pain and suffering or the futility of drinking a day or a month ago. And if that's not enough, the second half of step one is that I have a, an internal thirst for wholeness uh, that's always been there. And it's nobody's fault. It has nothing to do with my childhood. You know, I didn't get to that. I had four. My mother had four husbands. Husband, husband number two was my birth father, left when I was age nine. Husband number three was a domestic violence perpetrator um, that hurt us physically, that hurt us emotionally, spiritually, in every which way. That didn't matter. Um, I came into this world separate, apart, and different, um, pissed off, uncomfortable, nothing to do with them. But here it is now, the spiritual malady that had grown and grown. Um, I see that I have that. Um, and what's the answer? The answer is to go through with the rest of the steps. And I've been blessed over the last number of years to go through the steps and round and round because the steps are really about a circle. The steps are about going inside, uncovering, discovering, discarding the things that are blocking me from God. And why do I need God? See, I need God to stay alive, <laughs> most important relationship in my life, because if I don't have God between me and the thought of the first drink, the insanity will return. That's the beauty of it. See, God between me and the first drink allows me to live in a recovered state, not cured. So today that relationship needs to be nurtured. That relationship needs to be, you know, increased over time. Um, and that's what's happened for me. So I'll end with this, you know, about, about a year or so ago, um, you know, I saw that one can have um, incredible joy in the moment in a sea of sorrow. You know, our daughter Lauren got engaged, you know, a year ago. Um, and at the same time, our family lost a, somebody we love dearly, a best friend of mine. Her name was Barbara from cancer and it all happened over one weekend and the power of god and the power of this program is that i was able to stay functional i was able to be part of what needed to be done you know for that weekend and as much as we enjoyed you know our daughter's engagement there was this of course difficulty with respect to the fact that we're also mourning barbara's death and here it is a year later my daughter, Lauren, got married about a few weeks ago in upstate New York, back to upstate New York. And I was blessed to be part of this. I was blessed to <laughs> see my daughter go down the aisle with my wife, you know, both of us. I was blessed to get a first look at her dress um, and picture this scene, right? We're on a lake and Lauren is, um, you know, behind me. I'm facing the lake and Lauren taps me on the shoulder. I turn around and we're hysterical crying. I mean, snot nose crying the whole thing. Um, and a little bit later in, in the night, you know, I, I get to say a few things. Um, I get to give a toast to the happy couple. And here's something about what I said. I said, love is patient. Love is kind. Love rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always hopes, and always perseveres. Lauren and Nick are a couple for the ages who met during the pandemic fell in love and then decided to share their lives together, forever singing. Then I look at you and the world is all right by me. Just one look at you and I know it's gonna be a lovely day. Yeah, that's living in the fourth dimension, being catapulted into the world of the spirit. Um, so the age of miracles is upon us. Our own recovery proves that Bill Wilson said that. And I was taught, you know, don't leave until a miracle happens and don't leave when the miracle happens. Um, this is an absolute miracle program. Um, 
the 12 steps, the formula for sobriety, the formula for God, and the formula for the good life, all wrapped up into one. And it's been my experience, you know, that with this warning, you can stay sick in Alcoholics Anonymous and have plenty of company, or you can get well in Alcoholics Anonymous and have plenty of company. So I've had the not yets, I've had the if onlys, I've had the yeah buts. But on page 152 of our big book, I get to experience, we all get to experience the you wills. You will make lifelong friends. You will be bound to them with new and wonderful ties. You will escape disaster together and you will commence shoulder and shoulder your common journey. Then you will know what it means to give of yourself that others may survive and rediscover life. You will learn the full meaning of love thy neighbor as thyself. One of my favorite movies is The Wizard of Oz. There's a lot of us in The Wizard of Oz. And one of the scenes for me is at the end when Dorothy's standing there with Toto the dog. She's getting set to go home. And Glenda, the good witch of the East, says to her, you know, what have you learned? And eventually, um, Dorothy and Glenda agree that um, not only is there no place like home, but she always had the power. See, the power was always inside, you know, our great reality, God, our higher power has always been inside. So if you ask me what I'm most grateful for, it's the pain, the pain that brought me to you so you could bring me to God. Um, there's a quote by William Blake that says it exactly right. William Blake said something like, I sought my soul, but my soul I could not see. I sought my God, but my God eluded me. I sought my brother, and I found all three. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Um, you know, I love you all, and uh, and I'll end with that. Thank you. Wow, Andy H., I apologize for not going off camera. Um I am driving and I want to take questions, but um, wow, that was unbelievable. And I'm a little disappointed. You haven't fully been crying yet. So I hope we get that, that excited and that move that um, we'll all get there. Andy, do you sing? You mentioned you do music in your into music. Do you, do you do any singing? Can you, if so, can you share any song with us? Something to get us extra inspired. That just came to me. Well, thanks for asking, Karen. Uh, unfortunately, no, you know, that's on the top of the list. You know, if I get, uh, you know, <laughs> put into another human body after this one is exhausted, uh, no, I, I can't sing. But, but, um, and if I try, believe me, you'll, this meeting will shut down instantly. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I was, I was going to threaten that um, I would redo my uh, eighth grade rendition of my solo in Somewhere Over the Rainbow. <laughs> and she brought up Dorothy and all that, you know. But thankfully, thankfully, right, all of us addicts, um, I still relate to that music and all that, being a, a girl who grew up in L.A., you know, we're out of Oz, right? We're out of fantasy and into reality, and we're discovering that reality in the fourth dimension is is fantastic. It's just so amazing. And that was like, like you said, it was all right there. It was all right there. Who knew that so much goodness, um, so much godness, so much happiness was right there in, in the seemingly mundane, you know? Um, that's so great, Glenda the Good Witch. I, I want to really get into that moment with you in the parking lot. What changed? When you got from step zero to step one, like, what, what changed? How did you just, like, you know, just fully surrender? What, what happened there? Yeah. So, you know, of course, in retrospect, you know, um, you know, I have, I have somewhat of an answer to it, um, but I'm sure I'm, you know, I'm not um, able to completely know um, what, what went on before that uh, moment was a succession of being um, tortured and having whatever misgivings or reservations I had starting to be choked off because this disease, you know, um, certainly will take me drunk, but will take me miserable. And what happened was um, sitting on page 30 in the big book with my sponsor, going to meetings, um, 
started to strip away my um, my denial uh, and my ability to, st- to negotiate, right? Because, see, I'm still defending my right to drink in some way in step zero. I'm still saying to myself, you know, that if certain things change, maybe I can go back to drinking again, you know, let go of the other substance, you know. Um, I didn't mention that I'd left Susan for a period of time. Um, you know, maybe if I do that again, you know, all these things and they're all options that are being eliminated, um, as this wall is being, you know, crushed, incinerated. So it, it wasn't, the moment was the crescendo of that period of time. Some people have that period of time for years. Some people never come back to us. Some people die in that in that period of, of step zero. Um, but for me, it was a six month torture. And then I can see standing in that parking lot um, very vividly. It's a parking lot here. It's a shopping center in Westwood, a Kmart shopping center. Kmart's out of business, but you know, the parking lot remains. And uh, I just was different after, you know, it was Oh, okay. You know, that, that was, ah, you know, (laughs) and now I can put words around it at the time I couldn't, but the moment it happened, um, suddenly, and I, and I believe that's an awakening right there. You know, I'm now able to identify, see for me, the gift of desperation, you know, I think only in recovery programs, we talk about that as a gift, desperation, right? So that gift of desperation had grown louder and louder. And eventually, you know, when I went into that abyss of my own wretchedness, sober, well, not sober, but let's say not drinking, um, suddenly I got the gift of identification. And that came in that order for me. And uh, once that identification was clear, it didn't matter what my circumstances were on the outside. You know, we talk about the unmanageability in the first step. And I know like a, a lot of others, the unmanageability that gets talked about is what went on in the outside, the consequences, right? It's the, in the inside. And at that point, then it didn't matter that, you know, um, I'm a Jewish guy from Brooklyn and everybody around me, a Irish Catholic from the Bronx, you know, all this stuff that the disease uses to separate us. Suddenly that goal got cast aside, but it took time and it took, and it took pain. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Gift of desperation. And it's so scary, right? When, uh, you know, I'm saying this as an addict and as an Al-Anon for any Al-Anons of the line, you know, it's like, we sometimes see those around us and like, by the grace of God, we were helped. We, we kind of, took the olive branch of the step 12 or, you know, decided to, you know, love ourselves enough to, to take that first step. But, uh, you know, it's scary for those of us who are Al-Anons that, you know, that other person, they, they might make it, they might get desperate enough and change, or they might not, they might hit their rock bottom. Um, I don't know if there's a question there, but just sharing that thought, any, any comments on that? You've been around for a while, Andy, that, you know, that's scary, you know, you got desperate enough and it was, you know, your past became your greatest asset, but it didn't always work out that way for, for our loved ones, for our fellows. Yeah. Um, right. There's two sides to that, that desperation, um, you know, going from unmanageability to living life unbearably. Um, it's a slippery slope because it can easily be that, um, people go on to the bitter end. Um, you know, some of us though, and me included, <clears throat> had that desperation as a birthplace of, of willingness. Um, because see, God expresses him or herself in willingness. And when I'm willing, I'm changed. It made me willing, um, to look at things that I never, ever would have thought of looking at that were always inside me eating away from the inside out. Um, you know, I'm back to this, um, those letters between Bill Wilson and Carl Jung. They're so important because Carl Jung, you know, who gave us the second part of step one, he, 
he used the expression spirit is contra spiritum, which means that the spirits of God are greater than the spirits of alcohol. Yet our big book talks about, you know, king alcohol. Um, in the end, the 12 steps, you know, um, the 12 steps are, are much more profound. Um, there's that expression, if you go after the king, you best not miss. And AA goes after king alcohol and doesn't miss. See, I needed the third dimension to fail me. Um, you know, living in the dungeon of self, lying, cheating, getting over, um, you know, everything was about me. My life was, you know, about taking, you know. It got to a point where the idea of telling the truth wasn't wasn't a good idea anymore. You know, I just I just stopped telling the truth. I was exaggerating, doing everything I could. Um, yet, um, yet I knew I was plunging down further, right? Um, in a constant state of fear. Uh, so the third dimension failed me. It left me homeless, not physical homeless. See, I had not yet experienced that, but a homelessness inside. I was frozen. You could say I had a poverty of spirit. So the third dimension had to fail me. And um, and I believe this is a spiritual axiom, you know, um, that the spiritual realm, the fourth dimension, remains closed unless you have a complete bottom experience that's personal to you. Um, and what do I mean by a bottom? A bottom is, somebody once gave me a great definition of a bottom, that, that it's not only asking for help, but it's willing to take the help. There are a lot of folks that are asking for help, but do they take the help? I played that game too. I wasn't willing. I was, I was, you know, asking for help, but I wasn't willing to do anything about it. And that desperation brought me to that moment. Um, and, you know, you mentioned surrender. So there's the act of surrender, you know, where, you know, we have that great military analogy where, you know, you put down the weapon, defeated army, and then, that army sits there and waits for instructions that happen, you know, that act of surrender. But today it's about the state of surrender. How do I stay surrendered? And that's a renewal process that happens a moment to moment basis, you know, every day through, you know, the practice of steps 10, 11, and 12, but also taking other people through the work. Um, so. Wow. So much in there about about surrender, about, you know, willing to take instructions. You know, here in Israel, we're at war, and I won't get political, but a, a friend of mine's son is a, is a paratrooper. He's a real hero, and his, uh, his plane was hit by an RPG, and they all had to jump. So when I think about surrender, it's, it's not about when he's, you know, telling the bad guys to put their hands up over their head, and they're stripped down, you know. And, and, and searched and, you know, and brought to the security services and interrogated and all that, you know, naked and handcuffed and all that. It's, um, it's more when he's jumping out of the plane, right? Because the RPG hit, I mean, how true is that for us addicts? The RPG hit the bla plane, the, the plane slid and he just had to jump and he just, you know, okay, you know, God, help me land in the right place. Take me to the right place. Put me in the right place. Right. So, um. So yeah, that those you know those war metaphors that they sometimes seem antiquated in old English when this book was written, you know, mm -hmm. after World War is here. Here they're all too relevant. Um, enough about that. Um, talk to us. You spoke about you know not all people are willing to surrender. Not all the people you work with. You know the big book tells us very clearly most of us will not make it. Talk to us about your work with others. You know anything you want to share on how you get started, what you do, how many people you work with at a time, mm. you know, lessons you've learned, you know, tips for people who are newly sponsoring or, or, or love some, you know, sponsor coaching. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's my view today that the real work in Alcoholics Anonymous, in any of the 12 step fellowships, I'd say, um, is, um, taking, somebody else through the steps in a sense to make this a sponsor creation program right because um having people um awaken 
so that they can go help others um, is the best way um, to spread this. Um, this, I don't know, maybe the greatest love story of the 20th century, right? Because what we're doing here is is recognizing um, the oneness in us all. Um, you know, I sense myself in you, um, and now I know me, and the reverse is true too, the oneness. So that's love and, you know, one definition of love. Um, my experience is the big book gives us great, great directions, you know, in working with others. Um, probably about 25 different directions, but they all come to one place. And that's that um, as difficult as it is, uh, we need to consider letting go of the unwilling. Uh, it may be that the best we can do is plant the seed for another occasion when that person is ready um, and willing to go to any lengths. And what do I mean by going to any lengths? I mean, going to any lengths, and I needed to find by my sponsor, you know, going to any lengths means to find out that the drink is to die, which is step one. The second part of willing to go to any lengths is to connect to a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem, which is you. <laughs> the book is clear about that. It's not everybody else. One of the greatest promises in the book is that my troubles are my whoa, own. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're not going to skip over that. Say that one more time slower. That, that's, that's, some golden, that's some golden nuggets in there um, for the people in the back. <laughs> Rewind. Willing to go to any lengths, right, for victory over alcohol. Um, I needed it defined. And what does that mean? Are you willing to go to any lengths? If I'm asking somebody that I'm going to work with or working with, are you willing to go to any lengths to find out that the drink is to die? That's step one. That journey in step one where um, denial, delusion, refusal, negotiation is still going on. Um, step zero. Uh, and next, are you willing to connect to a power greater than yourself? I'm just going to jump in there for one second. Excuse me sure. for interrupting. For those of us who don't relate to, al you know, I'm not an alcoholic and I'm not a coke addict. I'm a codependent, I'm a compulsive overeater, I'm a love addict, validation addict. So you can edit, replace that to drink is to die, you know, to eat sugar is to die. For me, you know, the big book actually says this for all addicts, you know, we pray God, please, um, please save me from being angry. To be angry is to die. You know, maybe you want to call that a drama addict, right? You know? I was like, things are not going so well. You know, I get a hit when I yell at my kids, you know. That's mm. the way we, we addicts get our adrenaline. But see, I know I have to course correct. Right? If I'm yelling, I better give myself a time out. And, um, okay, please go on because the best part of what you said is, of course, that the big book tells us that we're the problem. But, you know, we can't say that enough. Go yes, yes. Um, so the second part is step two, and that's the – connect to a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. Um, you know, a initial willingness, belief, um, faith, and then reliance and dependence on a power greater than yourself um, throughout the day. So when I'm working with people, you know, I, I'd like to say that that's what we're going to do. Um, you know, we're going to find out um, if there are any reservations, uh, any you know, lurking notions that are, you know, we talk about lurking notions. And just like within me, you know, there, there were. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of sponsorship um, has been, for me, the greatest gift. Uh, part of the reason is because it's always helping me. As I'm going through the work with another alcoholic, and I want to be clear about, you know, again, you know, and I've made mistakes. I think, you know, mistakes are just, you know, a lesson. Um, and the mistakes that I make today are, you know, not the same ones or not as intense as I was, you know, years ago when it comes to, to giving guidance, you know. Um, as a sponsor, my job is to help somebody meet the conditions to enter the world of the spirit. Um, and when they enter the world of the spirit, um, they can heal the broken. 
you know, with God's help. That's what my sponsor explained to me. So my experience has been that um, I've had um, men come through that are uh, not willing at first, but then become as willing as the dying can be. And they're out in the world now sponsoring others. Um, I've had folks come in and um, get through you know, parts of step four and they go out into the world and you don't hear from them. Um, I've seen people go through the steps with me and they've said, you know what, I'm done with AA. Thank you. And that's the end of it. I guess I'm getting to the point where, and I've seen people go out and die. So I'm getting to the point in which, um, it's heartbreaking. It's uplifting and heartbreaking because uh, I can't rob anybody of their journey. Their journey is their journey. You know, I can only be a guide to hopefully um, share my experience and allow them to have an experience with the big book because ultimately the big book is, is, a, is a set of mirrors. It's not the treasure, it's the map to the treasure. And sitting with you know, another alcoholic and going through um, the work in the book so that they can be awakened um, is out of my control other than showing them what has worked for me. And the beauty of it is now there are so many resources, um, so many resources available to, you know, use the 12 steps, um, whether you want to go through quickly you want to go through at a medium speed or go through grinding along slowly. Um, and it's not one size fits all. In some cases, it's people that need power right away. So then they can go through the steps very quickly. It's others that, you know, are at the point where um, the danger of them drinking is relatively, relatively, you know, um, low. And then you can go through slowly. Um you know, I've had the the privilege too of um, going inside beyond behind the prison walls in the state of New Jersey, the maximum security prison, and sponsor guys behind the walls and watch as those folks have come out. Some of them have stayed sober. Some of them have stayed sober and led crime free lives. Others haven't. But um, but you know, I stayed sober, right? That helped me. So that's the the duality of this experience, you know. Um, we are not saints, right? You know, I'll go back to Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton said that we care for ourselves in the service of others. Um, I don't know if he was talking about us, but, you know, he, it's definitely true, right? Um, so um, it's an experience that, uh, you know, I was taught not to miss. Um, and today, where am I at? So... I have um, six sponsees at various stages, you know, a couple of guys that, you know, been through the steps that are, you know, off sponsoring others. And because of Zoom, you know, I have four sponsees that are in the UK right now um, at various stages. And I hope to visit the UK next year, you know, and actually see them face to face. So it's been, it's been a blessing to have that um, that have outreach, you know, now, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, old 12 step programs really love, they, they all love stories. Right. Um, and the ability now be the zoom platform, right. You know, the threads of recovery that gets stitched even more and more, you know, through zoom has been an absolute miracle. And I'm sure folks on the line know all about that. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe I'll just stop there, Karen. Well, dang, you just really knocked my socks off. Wow. So much in here. Um, Andy, I'm going to ask you to put your number in the chat because sure. um, I know I'll be, you know, reaching out to you as a 12-step mentor, friend, brother, etc., if you guys want 
I'm comfortable enough to say that you guys could all reach out to Andy and get his Absolutely. insight, experience, strength, and hope. If you are looking for a sponsor, I don't know if he's available, but I'm sure he could point you to one of his many sponsees. If you're a woman looking for a woman, I'll put my number in the chat too. Or if you know people looking for female sponsors, I just finished someone up on the 12 steps. Woo that's what we do. We get people to God and get them helping others. Right, Andy H? Absolutely. Let me know. I'll also put uh, the information for for our home group, um, and uh, so you know we're on every Saturday. We have uh, speakers from around the world. It's it's a uh, it's a meeting from around the world now, um, and uh, we've been going at it now for for almost four years in this way. Uh, let me just get that info uh, info out there here, um, and. Uh, one second. Amazing. So Andy H, I'm going to ask you to pray us out. I'm on, I'm getting to work here, but um, I'll have to help other people in another faction of my life. Mm -hmm. As we all practice these principles in all our affairs, I want to ask Andy to press out. Andy, maybe you'll let everyone know after that, once I hop off, if you're able to take questions or anyone wants to ask you, you can, um, I'll let you decide on that and you can go as long as you want. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you, Karen. It's been a uh, been wonderful experience. And um, thank you all for joining in this gathering. Why don't we have a moment of silence for the still suffering and their families, both inside and outside this call, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Look at God. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Everybody, shine your light. I'm just feeling so much love and connection to you all, all over the world. There was a man put his hand by the side of his mouth, and he wanted to scream, but the sound never came out.
as he read from the book only truth spilled out so he reached for a power to help him through the night cause what lives in the dark Die.